Hi, I'm Barbara Oakley, and I'm a professor of engineering at Oakland University in Michigan. Neuroscience can give us a lot of information about how to learn more effectively. So for example, we can only hold a little bit of information in working memory. We use what we've already planted in long-term memory in order to be able to solve problems or understand concepts. So from neuroscience, we know that you should introduce bits and pieces of information and have people practice with that information because that's what's going to allow them to draw that information from long-term memory and manipulate it in working memory. Uh, neuroscience lets us know that it's okay to practice things. It's okay to get information incorporated into long-term memory. That it's not, it's not good to just tell students, you can always go look it up and, and that's going to solve your informational problem. Because, for example, would you ever just go look up French on Google Translator and think you understood French? There's some knowledge you have to have in your long-term memory in order to be able to be a master of that material. Neuroscience can also inform us on pedagogical practices that are not useful. Uh, for example, we know that the later you begin learning something, the more difficult it can be. So when you can start earlier with your children, it's a value. So you don't want to start learning mathematics until you're you know, 10 or 12, because earlier makes it easier. Um, also, the idea that you shouldn't memorize anything, that, that can be really problematic because a little bit of memorization serves as uh, like a, uh, something that's like a scaffold that your understanding can build from. And in fact, as you practice, for example, in math, and you practice and you become more proficient, you get quicker at it, that can help you to really build your conceptual understanding. So, uh, so these are the kinds of insights we're actually getting from neuroscience. So there, there is a debate about learning styles and whether learning styles, knowledge of that is helpful for a teacher and helpful for students. I, I think the verdict is still out about, um, we, well we do know that everyone does learn somewhat differently. But learning styles, as at least at present they are conceptualized, can be problematic if teachers use them in their classrooms. For example, let's say that you think a student, or a student may claim or even test to be better as a visual learner as opposed to a auditory learner. But when you actually give a student who thinks they're better at visual learning, if you present the information to them through hearing, they're just as good as at visual. So it's actually just an idea that the student has that they're better at one as opposed to the other, but when we actually test it out, that, that just doesn't hold water. And more than that, if you as a teacher teach according to the idea of, oh, my student is an auditory learner, I'm going to read to them to help them learn better instead of giving them visual materials. You can actually be hurting that student because if you're doing everything by hearing, well, when that student goes out in life, they're going to be taking visual tests. And if you're giving them everything by hearing, you're actually weakening their, their ability to take visual tests. So it's, it can be hurtful, harmful for students to teach according to one style. In fact, we learn through many different um, modes of learning. We learn visually. We all learn visually uh, by hearing, unless we're, we have some sort of impairment. We learn in different ways. So by presenting information in different ways, we're, uh, we're helping students to kind of lift all of their modalities for learning. 
As far as assessment goes, there's, it's hard to know at present how often is too often. And of course, it depends on the test itself. I, if the test is not really relevant or it's, uh, it's not well thought out, it's not going to be very helpful for students to just be tested all the time. However, there's plenty of evidence that students learn better from tests than they do from simply studying. So one hour of testing as opposed to one hour of studying, the student will learn far more on that one hour of testing. So a modicum of tests actually helps students learn. Uh, it provides a little bit of stress and that, that's called eustress, good stress, that can help students concentrate on the material and also give them motivation to study uh, sometimes subjects that can be uh, a little uh, harder to motivate oneself to study. My opinion on use of technology by teenagers is that if there's a way to provide balance and to also not have students be online all the time, that's a good thing to, because now sometimes students can use their smartphones all the time, they're always online, and it can almost be addictive. You want to check your messages, check your messages, but, but that way lies danger because students don't get used to being bored, which is where creativity often arises, and they are always wanting this instant gratification. So some balance where you have off time, where you don't have online materials can be a great thing. I do have to say that studies have shown those who read books for three hours a week, so a book, not, not blog posts, not you know, uh, uh, magazine articles, anything like that, but they actually spend that time immersed in a book, controlling for every variable they could those individuals live several years longer. It's, it makes a difference when you have that calm space. And so I think a bit of calm space is a valuable thing. What piece of advice would I give to someone who's kicking off a MOOC? I would say be passionate uh, about for learners and be passionate about the details. Don't just expect that you can teach your course like you do in a classroom and then you give it off to the editors and they'll take care of everything else. The more involved you are in the creation of those videos, uh, and videos are really an important aspect. You don't want to just throw a bunch of written materials onto a MOOC because they can get that anyway. But you on a video, that's where it's all at. And the kind of impact you can have through a well-made massive open online course is absolutely unbelievable. You, you, can, you can change people's lives all around the world and we have the means of outreach now through these courses that you can do that and you will never go back if you start teaching a MOOC. A memorable educational experience that affected my life was I, I won this little award that allowed me to go to a, a conference on education. And so I went, I was walking by in the hallway and I saw there was this workshop on student-centered learning. And I feel so bad now because I remember thinking at the time, student-centered learning? That, I mean, that's so stupid. What a stupid term. Because isn't it supposed to be us as teachers, as professors, imparting this information to students? How can students, you know, uh, what's going on with it? So, intrigued, I went into this workshop and it changed my life. Uh, I, I began to work, I, I began to realize that students often learn really well from one another, as well as from you. And so I began incorporating active learning exercises where students learned from one another as well as from me, and my classes were far the better for it. In TED is, I think, 
probably the most well-organized, instructive, fantastic conference I've I've been to. It's it's just amazing how large it is, the confluence of people from very different backgrounds, and uh, the enthusiasm of the the par participants. I feel very fortunate to be here.